Hi, everyone. Welcome. We'll just give a few more seconds so folks can get in from the waiting room. Thanks for joining us today. Hi, Chris and Melissa. Break a leg. Can't wait. Hi, Lori. How are you? Doing well, been looking forward to this. How are you? Pretty good, pretty good over Thanks. here. Any slides um, or materials uh, within the week? We'll be taking questions in the chat today. Please feel free to put questions in the chat to everyone or chat the presenter or myself privately. We will try to address all questions before the training concludes. If you need technical support for the meeting today, please chat tech support from the pull down menu. We ask that in the large session, all attendees mute their microphones unless called upon to participate. Being on camera is optional. We do have closed captioning available during this meeting. You can turn on that service in the menu bar. The recording will also be sent with captions. We very much value feedback. So we will have a short evaluation for you to fill out at the end of this webinar. We ask that all participants have respect and allow grace for one another today. Please experience this training, how you learn best, and let me know if there's anything I need to know today. And so today um, we will be going over reclaiming indigenous health, uh, collaboration with tribal nations and organizations. And I am going to pass it off to my colleague, Nadal Shoemaker. Thanks so much, Yui. Um, we're really thrilled to have helped um, work with American Cancer in, American Indian Cancer Foundation in this work and, and listened about the findings and the outcomes of the years long work that they have done. I want to introduce our two presenters today. First is Melissa Buffalo, who is, who is um, uh, serving as the interim chief executive officer of ACAF. She received her undergrad in child psychology from the University of Minnesota Twin Cities and earned her MS in human development from South Dakota State University. She has extensive experience working in the public health area with a variety of roles and a, a brings a wealth of knowledge to ACAP and also to all of us as well. Um, she is committed to working with and for tribal communities, both urban and rural, and supporting indigenous people with opportunities to heal emotionally, historically, spiritually, and physically from the burdens of cancer. Our second presenter is going to be Chris Johnson, who is, an, who is currently the Prevention and Policy Manager at the American Indian Cancer Foundation, which is the national nonprofit organization established to address tremendous cancer inequities faced by Native communities. Chris holds a Master's of Arts in Educational Administration with a special specialty in adult and higher education from the University of South Dakota. He focuses his efforts on advancing health equity in tribal communities through culturally tailored policy, system and environmental changes and community engagement solutions. I am very pleased to turn it over to Melissa and Chris now um, for the presentation. Melissa? Oh, are Oh, good. Okay, there's, I was like, wait, are we sharing? I see it. <laughs> thank you, Nadal, for that introduction. And again, thank you to the American Heart Association and Voices for Healthy Kids for this opportunity. Chris and I are excited and happy to share a little bit about the American Indian Cancer Foundation and then our specific IEE work. Um, again, I'm Petu Washte, Tanya Wahi, Melissa Buffalo, Imachi Apie, Michi Chanu, Yunke, Kanji Wakba, Oyanke Na, Meskwaki, Himantahan. Um, good afternoon. Welcome. My name is Melissa Buffalo, as Nada had mentioned. I am an enrolled member of the Meskwaki Nation in Iowa. I'm also Dakota from the Crow Creek and Lower Bill Sioux tribes, and I am a mother of two. Um, I'll let Chris introduce himself as well. Hello, everyone. My name is Chris Johnson. I am the Prevention and Policy Manager with the American Indian Cancer Foundation. Um, I am Sistan Wapton, Dakota, so I grew up in South Dakota. Um, enrolled in the Sistan Wapton Oyate. I've been with ACAF for a little over five years. And uh, like Melissa said, just really excited to share this work that we've been doing throughout the past year and you know, really see how we can support, support others in this work as well. So I'll pass it back over to Melissa. Um, thank you, Chris. Um, next slide. So again, just um, an overview of what um, Chris and I are going to be talking about today. Again, just that overview of the American Indian Cancer Foundation. 
um, how we address those um, indigenous health equities and how those partnerships are important that we do that with and how we partner with tribal nations and indigenous serving organizations. And then I will hand it over to Chris to talk specific about the IEE project that we led. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> So um, American Indian Cancer Foundation is a national nonprofit established to address the tremendous cancer inequities faced by American Indian and Alaska Natives. The mission is to eliminate those cancer burdens on American Indian families through education and improve access to prevention, early detection, treatment, and survivor support. ACAF was founded in 2009 and became operational in 2011. So we're super excited as we look at, you know, celebrating our 10th annual um, Pow Wow for Hope and all that comes in of being operational for 10 years. Um, we are a national nonprofit. Again, I know we talk about that in, you know, this, this slide, but really highlighting the work we do, um, even though we're housed in Minneapolis, we are thankful for those partnerships across Indian country and those that work with tribe and tribal communities. Um, all of our board members and the majority of our employees are American Indian um, with an array of experience and ex expertise in serving the health needs of our people. Uh, next slide. So our vision really is to see a world where cancer is no longer a leading cause of death for American Indian and Alaska Natives. So through hard work, culturally appropriate community-based programs, policy change that affords Native people access to the best prevention and treatment strategies, we really see a day where American Indian communities are free from the cancer, from the burdens of cancer. And I think I speak for both Chris and I, we really come from it from that, not only a professional lens, but that personal connection we have to cancer and the inequities um, within our immediate families. So we both have um, cancer impacts and so, thankful to do this work that we both believe in personally and professionally, along with, you know, majority of our staff and our board. Uh, next slide. So when we talk about this work, we really want to talk about this inequities with the American Indian cancer data. So we start here because when we talk about those health issues with our Indigenous communities, having accurate or any data at all has been a struggle in Indian country. And this is due to several reasons. So most common being, you know, that smaller sample size. And then the big one is that racial misclassification. So the data shown in the chart to the right shows that for American Indian and Alaska Natives, that the cancer death mortality rate has increased over the last 20 years while decreasing for whites over that same time period. So really highlighting that as we see, you know, those national successes of the cancer rate and really seeing, you know, those efforts, but unfortunately for American Indian Alaska Natives, it's only gotten worse. So really seeing the importance of the work we do across our teams, as well as, you know, that impact of COVID. So really seeing that need to re-engage our communities on the importance of screening and, you know, then working with organizations and entities to really help us get accurate up-to-date data. Um, Next slide. I love this slide. It's one of my favorite ones. So at ACAP, we really understand that need to assess our ways of life as Indigenous people when starting any new initiative. And so we look at our worldview as Indigenous people that we've always seen it as non-linear when compared to Western worldview. So you'll see how this slide is laid out. Um, and we see that indigenous worldview is about interrelatedness, balance, sustainability, and we know that our life ways are rooted in culture and grounded in respect for all living things. And we know that um, as native people and as indigenous people, we're often collective in nature versus individualistic. So always coming from that we point. Um, and I think that's ingrained in us as we you know, grow up and things we do both in our personal and professional life, but it's always a wee thing. And I'm so thankful for those opportunities and being able to come from that grounding. So then when we looked at that collective culture, really emphasizing that family and work group goals above those individual needs, whereas individualism um, emphasizes that personal achievement. And then strengthening this connection creates opportunities for us to be healthier as indigenous people. And so really using this work, um, this worldview to guide our work. And Chris will get into it a little bit more as we go into the project. Um, next slide, please. <laughs> and so when we talk about that full um, health potential, really being able to achieve it, we need to acknowledge and understand those adverse social determinants of health that have really hindered 
our ability to achieve health equity as Indigenous people. So seeing this slide, you know, really gives those visuals and some of the, the key points and bullet points to it. So we know that these social determinants of health include historical and intergenerational trauma that were passed down through colonization, genocide, stress, disruption in childhood development, poor access to healthy food, services, employment, education, and transportation. And we know that many of these adverse childhood or these adverse social determinants of health lead to a cycle of adverse childhood experiences. Most of us know those as ACEs. And we think about those such as that household dysfunction, abuse, and neglect. And then these adverse experiences often lead to behavioral risk factors such as lack of physical activity, unhealthy eating, commercial tobacco use, and addiction. And we know that these behavioral risk factors really then lead to poor health outcomes and ultimately early death. So again, kind of seeing that flow on the left side. And next slide. But I love that we can balance that, right? We look at those ACEs and those social determinants of health and can be intimidated or sometimes left feeling heavy. But when we look at, you know, health equity and all the great partnerships and being, being able to help our communities achieve that full health potential, we have that work there and it's being created. So by engaging in an upstream approach to achieving health equity means we need um, to support those positive social determinants of health, such as social and economic opportunities, some of those increased access to healthy foods and sacred medicines, having safe physical activity spaces, um, access to healthcare, education, housing modes of transportation and access to the internet. And we know that looks different both in rural frontier and urban areas. So being able to um, see those changes and what those needs are in each of those communities. And then we know that another key piece to achieving that full health um, potential is really by breaking those cycles of trauma, right? So looking at those protective factors, such as that cultural connection, belonging, resilience, safety, healthy coping skills. So really thinking about, you know, that, that importance that, you know, all of our tribal languages have, and even that connection itself could be an opportunity to break those cycles of trauma. And then how, what are some of those preventative adverse childhood experiences? So nurturing stable relationships, culturally tailored family education, breastfeeding, um, connecting families to community system resources. Um, and then lastly, looking at, you know, those social, um, determinants of health. And then finally, by incorporating a balanced lifestyle that, that could include physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual balance, we're able to achieve full health equity and really to see that full potential come to life as Indigenous people and as um, communities. Um, next slide, please. So as we saw in those previous slides, um, American Indians face tremendous inequities in our communities. And again, they vary by each community and are unique. So we really have to work together to over overcome those burdens because we know that um, American Indians face large inequities, especially in cancer and other chronic disease, largely related to those health behaviors, smoking, eating, exercise, and then those social determinants of health, education, job, safety, and we know that American Indians are too often on the worst end of every health indicator reported, access to healthcare, environmental quality, substance abuse. Um, and then we're all here because we know that we wanna work together to create positive change and promote, promote those healthy norms in our communities. And so again, going back to that importance, right, of the data and having accurate up-to-date data. And we get that, you know, it's 1% of the US population, but when we break it down in the work we do, there's over 500 federally recognized tribes in different regions. So really being able to push that. And I think, you know, all of our projects and teams across policy and prevention, research, cancer equity are really helping to address those inequities and, and really having data that can help us drive this story and, and help um, improve those dissemination efforts even more. Um, and so we know that our reality is determined by history. So health inequities are directly linked to determine and deliberate efforts of US federal, state and local governments to uproot American Indians from their lands, eradicate their languages and destroy their ways of life. So again, thinking back to 
those social determinants of health and some of being able to break that trauma, right? This is where in my mind, I want to go down some of the training um, that I give on intergenerational training and historical trauma, but I won't go there, but it kind of has me going down that route. So really being able to help folks understand how efforts such as the boarding school really plays a part today in how some of us parent, right? And how some of us have lack of parenting due to some of those historical traumas that have happened um, historically. Um, so really seeing that we have to work together. And again, this work is, uh, the work ahead we know is about reclaiming a strong and healthy future for generations to come. And I'm so thankful that we've been able to do that with some of these conversations we had through this project. Um, next slide, please. So although we like to acknowledge that the, the state recognizes the, the deliberate efforts of the government to eradicate Indigenous people from the U.S., we know that there are government policies and systems that were intentionally created um, that have had lasting negative impacts on communities that need to be talked about when we talk about those disparities that we face today, kind of how I, I jumped ahead, as you can see, <laughs> coming up with those strategies to achieve health um, equity. And so these are just some of the systems and policies that were put in place. I won't go through all of them. Um, I'll name a few. The Indian Removal Act was a grant unsettled, which was a grant that unsettled lands in exchange for Indian land. Um, the Dawes Act, also known as the Allotment Act, reduced the tribe's ability to live in their traditional ways. The Dawes Act ended community ownership on the land and parceled it up by pieces to be owned by individual Native Americans, which impacted the tribe, the overall tribe's ability to hunt and live off the resources. So you'll see a lot of tribes that have what we know as their land is checkered board because one part could be owned by the tribe and then you go to another slot, which again could look checkered board, could be owned by a family. And so seeing where tribes are really working together with organizations like the Indian Land Tenure Foundation to really bring the land back to the tribe so that it's largely owned by the tribe and to, again, re-bring back some of those cultural ways and just, you know, for the tribe to have ownership of the land that was originally theirs. Um, the Indian Relocation Act was intended to encourage American Indians to leave the reservation to learn vocational skills and to assimilate to Western society. It basically was a one-way ticket from the reservation to cities such as some of the larger cities across the U.S., Minneapolis, Denver, Chicago, Oakland, New York, L.A. So you'll see some of these large urban areas that have a lot of housing and programming and nonprofits and organizations specific to American Indians. Here in Minneapolis, we have what's called Little Earth. It's a housing. And then on South Minneapolis has a lot of um, organizations for American Indians. And so basically that one-way ticket gave them money. You know, some of them didn't end up being able to get in the schools that, you know, those vocationals. And so they were stuck, right, with no way to get home. Um, the Indian Religious Freedom Act was, although it was in our favor, it technically wasn't. It was passed nearly 40 years ago in 1978 to protect and preserve the traditional religious rights and cultural practices of American Indians, Eskimos, Aleuts, and Native Hawaiians. Um, and then we know that the boarding school era was one of the most devastating times for American Indian Alaska Natives. The abuse that our parents, grandparents, and great grandparents faced during this time has led to tremendous impacts on our people today. So Amer many American Indian Alaska Natives who experienced boarding schools in a negative way have never went through a continuous have went through, sorry, have went through a continuous cycle of abuse, health disparities, and addiction that leave a lasting impact impact on our communities. Um, and when we talk about that, right, it's so close to home because I look at um, my dad's side and he's got six siblings and the youngest was sent to boarding school who's only 12 years older than me um, and she ran away twice because she couldn't handle it um, so you know those those stories are still very close to us and I'm sure Chris has stories as well and then just to give you a brief overview of the picture um, that was the chairman for the Mandan um, Hidatsa Rikara Nation in North Dakota Chief George Gillette and I believe this was in the 1940s where he had to sign away 40,000 um, acres of land, which created the Garrison Dam. And so there's a quote 
that's out there that talks about how he signs and what this does to his community. And you could see him crying, right? And if we look at the other people, all these men, in my opinion, are just looking like it's a waste of their time when, and so really just seeing the picture and being able to look at expressions and what does that mean for us? And, you know, for me as a native person, being able to see this man who tried to protect his land and his people. Um, next slide. So we know that health equity, again, is crucial for the well-being and vibrancy of our communities, again, based on some of the past and previous events that have happened um, for American Indian people as a whole and as communities. And we know that health is a product of those social determinants and those health disparities, and that health inequities stem from structural racism, discrimination, and poverty. And we're really looking for those solutions that are tribally led, community-based, and rooted in culture. Um, yeah, so next slide. And then this is where I will, that sounded, that ended abruptly, so I apologize, but I'm gonna hand it over to Chris Johnson. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so now I guess I'd like to talk about um, some of the IEE work group that we have done throughout this past year. And so just the disclaimer that this work was funded in part by Voices for Healthy Kids, um, which I'm sure as all of you know, is an initiative of the American Heart Association with support from uh, the Robert Wood Jeff Johnson Foundation. And so our policy lever work group is really focused around Indian country and really seeing you know, if the existing policy levers and policy bottom lines um, align with some of the work that is happening across Indian country already. And so here's just a, I understand that this is a, a lot of words to this slide, but it packs a lot of good information. And so um, the purpose of our project, like I mentioned, was to really um, understand and um, you know, understand the impacts and alignment of, like I said, those policy levers in addition initiatives across Indian country and really seeing if we can propose new strategies uh, for, for um, Voices for Healthy Kids. And so some of the specific goals that we have are to really understand how tribal nations and other American Indian Alaska Native serving organizations are really progressing towards achieving some of those existing policy levers and then understanding, you know, how is that affecting health equity um, and our you know, overall goal is to really strengthen the current levers and um, advance the success of, of voices. And so um, it's been a really exciting project to work on. Um, we're also um, looked at just different initiatives that are being completed across Indian country and looking for those, those parallels and seeing you know, what, are, what are key lessons that we can learn from, from those folks that are you know, taking on policy policy initiatives within their communities or organizations. And so it was our hope to recommend, recommend three to five opportunities to really improve um, the policy levers and just engagement in general um, within the Indian country settings. And so um, also wanted to make sure that we identify any of those health equity implications that may come from um, some of the existing uh, framework or policy levers and, and stuff like that. Um, and our final goal was to really just increase the collaboration and coordination among tribal, national, state, and local stakeholders that are all working within Indian country. And so, um, you know, just our overall goal is to really increase that, that communication and the collaboration and folks that want to, to partner with Indian country. Um, so we'll kind of get some more in, de in detail with that as we go along, but a part of our project is we did complete an assessment um, with our work group. And so this purpose was to, um, like I said, understand the impact and alignment of those um, tribal policy needs and see, um, you know, really how those are aligning with the current, current policy levers and bottom lines and then propose those st different strategies to build future campaign uh, pipelines and, you know, understand those different policies that are there to to increase the, um, the quality of lives for family and children across Indian country. Um, so in, a piece of this is we looked at um, how COVID has really impacted um, tribal nations or communities access to food. And so including things, you know, just like healthy food and, indig and indigenous food, uh, but just food in general as well. And so just learning, you know, how a lot of our communities have had to shift and identify different areas and priorities due to COVID. And so we know, 
that food policy may not have been on the, the forefront of their efforts just due to the, the immediate needs of their communities around COVID. Um, and so we also asked about different policy work that is currently being implemented and what they're um, interested in, in implementing in the, in the future. And so just looking for different policy successes um, that tribal nations have implemented, you know, within the past, um, we um, created a list of different policy initiatives and we asked if any of their tribal nations were currently engaged in any of those. And then we also did the same for um, just gauging some interest in pursuing or aligning with any of the um, policy initiatives. And so when we talk about policy work, we always um, think it's important to talk about tribal sovereignty. And so here is the definition just for tribal sovereignty in general. So that is uh, federally recognized tribes are recognized as possessing certain inherent rights of tribal of self-government and are entitled to receive federal benefits, services, and protections because of their spe special relationship with the United States. And so it's always important that we acknowledge that as Native people um, due to the, the certain um, aspects of sovereignty and that we are sovereign people and that we can really use that as an asset when leveraging these um, positive changes and increasing health equity within our communities. And so, like I mentioned, tribal sovereignty really does give our um, tribal communities, tribal nations, the unique ability to govern um, our own policies and our own systems. And so we'll kind of get more in detail on what that means when we think about things like preemption. I think that's coming up in a couple, couple slides, maybe my next one. Um, but just to keep in mind that tribal sovereignty really must be um, centered throughout all stages of policy implementation. And so keeping in mind that tribal nations should lead all of their own policy efforts and, you know, our outside organizations, you know, like ACAF or Voices um, should really aim to support and not dictate that work, um, but to really support the tribes as they need and where they identify. And so it's always important that that our tribes are leading that work. And so we did want, also want to mention preemption because we know that this did come up in our work group. And so we did include just a quick um, definition from the Public Health Law Center on preemption. And so that's when a higher level of government, so a state or federal um, level of government um, eliminates or reduces the authority of a lower level over a given issue. And so we see a lot of this um, I think within the commercial tobacco realm and things of that nature. Um, but it's also important that we talk about how tribal sovereignty affects state level preemption efforts. And so due to their tribal, um, tribal sovereignty preemption efforts typically do not apply to tribal nations, um, especially when this occurs at that state level due to like I said, tribal sovereignty and that government to government relationship that tribal nations have. Um, both with the federal government and the individual states. And so with, just to reiterate, um, tribal nations have both the right and the authority to regulate their lands independently from state governments. Um, so tribal nations have the right to enact and enforce laws and regulations for their nation, which may ultimately differ from state laws. Um, tribal sovereignty also really ensures that any decisions about the tribe with regard to their citizens, land, and property are made with their participation and the tribe's consent. And so I think we see a lot of this, like I mentioned, within tobacco policies at the state level. So you'll see um, like smoke-free air acts that are, you know, have been around for a lot of um, this at the state level for a while. And we're, um, you know, you won't see those um, automatically in place at a tribal level. And so that's where we kind of partner a lot um, with tribes is just making sure that they have, um, you know, policies that make sense for their communities and that they're really dictating how they work and um, making really highlighting the important like cultural aspects of um, of any of their um, sorry of their policy initiatives. And so another piece that came up um, throughout our work group was just talking about data. And I know Melissa touched on this um, in her slides, but you know we have 
Uh, for Indigenous people, we don't have the best history with research and academic organizations. And so it's important that we're extra, extra cautious when we think about data and um, making sure that we're doing research and collecting this information in the best way. And so um, just wanted to touch on some of the, the history aspects and um, you know that tribal IRBs, institutional review boards do exist within a lot of tribal communities. And so making sure that whenever we're collecting this information that we're going through the right approval processes and making sure that the, the tribes own the data that is theirs. And so um, we always just make sure to advocate for that and that we're doing that in the best way. Um, but also just wanted to talk about how um, American Indians and Alaska Natives are often um, referred to as an asterisk nation when it comes to data and research. And so this is due to a lot of different things like um, you know, not only is it the data often misrepresented, um, the tribal data is often invisible in, um, you know, national, state, and county data points just due to those small sample sizes, um, large margins of errors, or other issues due to uh, validity. And so, um, when we think about all of this information, you know, Melissa mentioned in her her slides about how this has negative implications for when we take on any new, um, you know, any health project in general with the tribal nation um, and how that really affects, you know, the outcomes and, you know, we can think about funding sources and all of that. Um, I feel like there's, there's a whole presentation in itself, so I don't want to go too, too far in the, in the weeds, but we do know that tribal public health leaders have really been pushing for the disaggregation of data for, for years. Um, and so just really understanding who is represented in that data must be considered when um, we're really using all of that data to inform tribal policy. Um, also, just make sure that we're supporting tribal nations and other indigenous researchers to really inform these efforts and really use that as a way to, to uphold tribal sovereignty. And so next, I just wanted to talk about the difference between uh, practice-based evidence and evidence-based practice. And so um, we just need to understand that within Indian country, there's an equal standing of, of that practice-based evidence and those evidence-based practices, except in cases where, where we do know that um, things are ineffective through scientific study. And so it's always important to, to really prioritize these indigenous ways of knowing. Um, so I included this graphic here of just some of the different things that, that Melissa also talked about, but if you can see on, on the turtle shell there um, is some more different things that, you know, that impact our life ways. And so it's always important to also think about, you know, when we're culturally adapting a program or policy or resource um, that we're really being thoughtful and identifying what is culturally appropriate for their communities. And so I know with the American Indian Cancer Foundation, we have gone through a lot of different um, different revisions with a lot of our resources. Um, you'll see that on some of ours, we'll have like community maps that look different for different tribes because we know they all don't look the same. And so I'm thinking of um, one that we have around that's for tobacco, but it's a community and the original one was based off of uh, Northern Plains tribal community area. And so it's obviously all green and full of lakes and, um, you know, that doesn't look like that everywhere. And so we did create some for um, the Southwest region where it's a little more dry, um, not as green. And so, and also they have different, different housing um, and different, you know, traditional practices. And so we were able to really work with their communities to culturally appropriate those resources. And so it's also important to think about that when we're um, doing some policy work, you know, thinking about we all have these policy templates that that exist out there, but knowing that those aren't always the best way to go um, about with working with a tribal nation. And so, you know, if you need to start from scratch, then you should do that. Um, so just thinking about that and keeping that in mind when we're we're working with tribal nations is super important. So um, wanted to touch on relationship building with tribal nations. And so this is 
this is key to the success of, of any project, especially with American Indian and Alaska Natives. I think um, Melissa touched on that, just how important it is and built into our culture and communities and ways of knowing of, of relationship building that you're, you're building respectful relationships and that they're equitable. You know, it's, it's a two way street and we're all in this together. So we need to make sure that, that we're upholding that and really building on that trust. And so, you know, take the time to learn about each other. It's, you know, it's always okay to take a step back and just learn learn you know the tribal ways learn some of their tribal languages um communities within their tribe um things like that it's 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 okay to take the time to do that i think oftentimes we we are so ingrained to just like get things going and move them really quick when we need to really take the time to build these relationships and get comfortable with each other so i think you know for the american indian cancer foundation we've had a lot of great community partners that we've been working with throughout the past, you know, nearly 10 years now. And so it's awesome to see like the process where we took that time to do that and how far along they are within um, implementing like PSE changes within their communities. And so that we, we went on that kind of journey with each other. And so it's super important that we do that, um, you know, communicate often and connect with each other learn your communication preferences and adapt to those styles. Um, I know pre-COVID, we did a lot of in-person work and that was really important to our tribe, our tribal partners is that we're, we're there and we're present in their communities and that, you know, that they can reach out to us whenever they need to and that they're comfortable and, you know, and that, that goes, you know, vice versa both ways that, you know, us as ACAF, we're also able to do that with them. And so, um, I know, you know, just adapting to some of those um, communication styles. So I know I just mentioned in-person meetings, um, but just having regular check-ins is super important and just being present within, within their community, but, you know, outside of what you're already working with them on. So a lot of times, you know, some of our, our tribal partners will invite us to like a community event and, you know, where it's not directly related to what we're working on, but it's super important to be present with them. Um, and so we'll go ahead and we'll attend those just as a relationship building aspect. And so I just think all of these are really important when we um, you know, start thinking about, about how to partner and, and work with tribal nations. Um, just you know, if that's the biggest thing that I can have you all take from this um, presentation is just the importance of, of these relationships. And so just to kind of go off of what I was just mentioning, just to authentically partner with our tribal communities. So really trusting that the community has the wisdom and the solutions to address their health disparities that afflict their own communities. So we know that um, they are the expert within their communities because they live there. This is their everyday life. I think a lot of times we kind of lose the, the human touch of some of this when we work in public health and think about policies at such a, a high level, but we always need to keep in mind that these are actual people and this will affect their lives. And so, um, you know, making sure that we trust the community and their wisdom. Uh, let's see here, Actualize, actualizing the positive change strategies um, through community member engagement and conversation. And so this is a really big important one is really taking that time to, to talk to community members, talk to to tribal leaders at, at all different levels, because we know that you're going to get different feedback from each of those different levels, depending on where you're where you're working at. And so, you know, being open to those conversations and knowing that they're not always going to be fun, but that's okay. And so, I think that's super important. And then just thinking about, you know, your own organization's practices and you know, being nimble and working with those. And, you know, if you need to change the way that you partner with, with our communities, then, you know, I think that's super important that you do do that. And so I think um, Melissa and I have been talking a lot lately around, you know, equity and what equity means to folks and how, you know, it seems to be a buzzword within public health right now and lately. And so how are we actually embodying equity has been super important for us as an organization. You know, I think we often think about like, 
or we don't think about it so much because we think it's so embedded within our work, but how can we call it out even more to, um, you know, really bring that out. And so I just have some final tips for partnering with tribal nations. And so, um, you know, working with indigenous experts to really develop and implement, you know, cultural competency training for all employees that work with tribal nations and, and other indigenous orgs. Um, you know, training can include things on um, tribal sovereignty, historical trauma, and institutional racism, health inequities, you know, but also, you know, thinking about the positives that come out of our communities. You know, Melissa shared all of those different policy efforts to really strip our people away from their culture and language and food ways. But, you know, thinking about the incredible strength and, and resiliency that that our community and, you know, others across across the world have gone through and that we're still here. Um, so it's important to always, you know, think about the positives too, because we do know there is a ton of great work out there. Um, another thing is to really seek input from Indigenous communities, you know, early on for those initiatives that are related to Indian country to really ensure that they're, they're culturally relevant. And so, you know, we have a lot of folks that are you know, they're okay with answering these kind of questions. And so this, this help is out there. You just have to know where to look. Um, and so I think um, Melissa and I are also always happy to just share back feedback on anything. So if, if anyone needs that, let us know. We're happy to either, you know, point you in the right direction or provide some feedback ourselves. Um, and then just another thing, just to strive for that continuous quality improvement throughout the whole process. So thinking you know, of getting getting that input from, from tribal nations and orgs, you know, at the funding stage, you know, or, you know, before you fund, when you're implementing and then at the end of the project. So making sure that you're continuously checking in on how, um, you know, your, your process is going throughout the whole time. And so we do know that, you know, we found really great success when funders and grant makers really consult with tribal nations and other other stakeholders like ourselves, you know, throughout that whole process to ensure that those those potential strategies are and requirements are realistic and that they're appropriate for our communities because, you know, we've we've seen a lot of times where where projects haven't worked in the best way. And so, you know, I think we have a, a lot of different topics and strategies that we can share throughout that um, process. But I think that's all I have for slides. So if you have any questions, I know I haven't checked chat. Yeah, Chris, thanks so much. And Melissa, thank you so very much. There are, um, there was one question that came from Erica um, who thanked for you for the presentation, but then asked, are there any lists available for American Indian and Alaska Native public health experts, researchers or consultants that you would recommend? Do you want me to answer, Melissa? <laughs> um, not that I know of, but if you if you find it, let us know. I know we do have a lot of connections within our, you know, our own team and our organization and our own contacts. I know the the work in Indian country is not too large, so I think we always can find a connection somehow. I know everyone. We always talk about how we're all related somehow, some way. So we are usually able to find find an expert that we need. Um, I don't know if there is an available list anywhere though. So I will defer back to Melissa on that one though. <laughs> yeah, not that I know of, like Chris said, I think Indian country is small. So definitely if there's certain regions, areas, you know, we can definitely provide some names or guide you in the right direction. I will say when it's small that in my previous role working with um, research, I actually got to work with Chris's mom. <laughs> so <laughs> love that I have all these connections to Sisseton. So yeah, just Erica, I think we took your email down. So definitely reach out. Sounds really good. I know there's Hannah's on the call and wanted to ask a question. Hannah, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Yes. Hi, everyone. Thank you. This presentation has been really great. Um, I felt like it was easier to say my question than try and type it. Um, so I, I work for Common Ground Health. We're a regional health planning organization in um, upstate New York. And we've recently started um, trying to 
engage with the local indigenous population. Um, and here, um, our local indigenous people are the Haudenosaunee. Um, and we're struggling to make connections because we're in kind of a strange location where we're in between some of the bigger hubs um, in the state for this nation. And so there isn't like a central place where we can go and try to, you know, make that initial contact. We have found a couple of uh, local native people that we're working with. Um, and right now we're doing work specific to COVID, um, but we want to expand and really start to think about addressing indigenous health disparities on a broader um, landscape. So just any suggestions you might have for those areas where the numbers are much smaller than maybe like some of the Western populations. We're looking at, I think about 13,000 um, Native Americans for our region. Um, so just any suggestions you have for, you know, how we might make those connections would be appreciated. Thanks. I don't know that I have a connection there, but have you connected with Roswell Parks Comprehensive Cancer Control? I know Dr. Rodney Herring um, works with the Indigenous Cancer Research within the Roswell Park. I have a connection. I've heard his name through someone else we're working with, um, but Buffalo is outside, is west of where we're talking about. Okay. We're um, in Rochester uh, between um, Buffalo and Syracuse, so kind of just in this weird space um, right. in the Finger Lakes region. Chris? So I also don't have a direct contact, but I'm, you know, I think, you know, we partner a lot with Dr. Herring. And so if you need us to kind of make a connection for you, I think we're happy to do that. I think he can point you in the right direction just because he's, he's there and has a, lot, a ton of experience throughout um, all of Indian country. So I feel like he's always a good person to connect with either way. Thank Thanks you. So much. Oh, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead, Hannah. I was just going to add, um, I think um, one of the people I'm working with, Dean Seneca, um, is connected with him. He's a public health expert, also native. Um, so I, I have a connection to him, so I can um, reach out that way. But thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, somebody did send me a private message um, for more. So you know, for some of the information around some of the questions that have been asked that the National Indian Health Board has a public health focus and you may want to, you know, kind of look that up and kind of see if there's more information there that you could find um, just to help you as you're learning. Um, any other questions? Um, anybody? And since I only kind of see one group at a time, if um, just unmute and maybe speak up or put it in the chat. My name is Drukaya Zephra Abdul Mutakalim. I'm the CEO and founder of the Musketeer Association. I'd like to ask a question if I'd be permitted. Of course. I'm in the Midwest area, that of Ohio. So we're the tri-state area of Ohio, Kentucky, Indiana. Very little conversation is actually going on in the Midwest concerning the Native Americans. Unless, unless I bring up the conversation in certain groups, it's never talked about. Um, I have Native American history myself from my grandmother's, from my father's side of the family and my mother's side of the family, but a lot of information as always is lost in, from the, mishandling, and I'm saying this gingerly because I'm not here to point fingers. I'm actually here to raise a hand and offer a hand. So what can I do to connect or at least <laughs> introduce more information to this area of the, the plight of the Native Americans here in this tri-state area? because I hear nothing, little or nothing being talked about. And I know very well, a lot of the lands were taken and they were moved. And can, um, what is it, uh, 
the state is Oklahoma was one of the areas that they were shipped off to. So do you have any connections in the tri-state area or the Midwest, just the Midwest? I'll, I'll take on the whole Midwest. That it doesn't bother me. Um, do you have any helpful hints or people I can start contacting and bringing into the conversation as the Musketeer Association reaches out to the fact that we're dealing with trauma, which is a disease that has affected all our communities. And they are not addressing the Native American communities at all. But I'm willing to. Can you hear that? I can feel Chris and I being like, who's going to take the lead? <laughs> I saw a comment come in for, um, on a, I'm going to, on a walk. I feel on like, a wick rose, yeah. On a wick rose um, from the Midwest Alliance of Sovereign Nations. Um, I was also, I know in, I forgot, you said Ohio, Tennessee. Did you say Tennessee? Ohio, Kentucky, Indiana is the tri state area in which I am uh, centralized around. So okay. it's called the tri state area. But, I, but it's not just those areas, we have the whole Midwest. Mm -hmm. And when I did my own history, studying my own history, it was horrifying of what had happened, not just to the African Americans, but all of the non-Caucasian people who were um, fled to the Midwest, getting away from the Southern part that was so awful. And then even when they arrived here, it wasn't so warming either. And then many went to Canada. Now I, I have a lot of Canadian connections and they're doing so much better than here in America, but that's neither here nor there, I, I'm here. Mm -hmm. So if you can help, I am here to my association is here to be of service. That's all I'm saying, so. Yeah, I think some of the things that come to mind, I know there's two comments for links, the Midwest Alliance of Sovereign Nations, and then um, Chris added the United um, South and Eastern Tribes, USETS um, um, organization. I would also, again, this is where you look at your state, right? And what do they do to support and work with tribes in a meaningful way? Um, I would start, with maybe even your health departments and seeing what work, you know, what's on there for some of the work they do with tribes, tribal communities. Um, Cause again, as native people, we don't have all the answers, but it's also like, how do we do this in partnership with everybody and that, you know, other folks could have the answers as well. Um, my first thought was thinking of the Indian Health Service. I know there's a regional office in Tennessee, but if that's not in your region, you can definitely look at the Bemidji um, area, service area for Indian Health Service. That's another start. All righty, I'm sorry. It is. Well, if, if uh, you will, uh, I put my email, my personal email there. You also have my association's email. You can contact me also by telephone. I put everything in there and uh, just send me as much as you can. And as we are building our, our effectiveness here in this area, I will also make sure the Native Americans are included in this effort that we're making. And you can go onto the website and see what we're trying to do because everyone's community is being affected by this and no one should be left out. We do believe in one for all and all for one and standing up for that. Awesome, yeah, Chris and I will reach out to you. Please do. I really appreciate you very much for at least listening to this person who has a, a mission and a message. It is one for all and all for one. And we need to stop this pandemic of trauma, period. Thank you so much. You know, I think everybody on this call has that same sense of, you know, of unity and um, learning from each other and listening to each other. So thank you so much for 
um, sharing your thoughts and a little of your history. And I'm sure Melissa and Chris will reach out to you just for some of the resources. Please make sure that you're also um, um, copying the resources that are in the, in the chat if you can. Um, I think those will be helpful for you as just doing some background um, research on your own. And before it gets too much farther, I'd like to also share, if you look in the chat, um, we do have a link for a very quick survey. We'd love to have your um, feedback on the presentation today. Um, so if you could, you know, please go to the link, do the survey for us. We'd really appreciate that. Anybody else have any questions or comments? Well, I guess if not, thank you so much, Chris and Melissa, again, for the work that you've done for the collaboration with Voices for Healthy Kids. Um, it's been a pleasure. I love working with you guys. And um, we do have our regular check-ins, everybody. So, so we practice what we preach in terms of that communication and, and true partnership. Um, if you have questions and follow-up, you can either reach out to me or Chris or uh, Melissa, and I'll make sure that they also um, get anything from, from you if it comes to me. Thanks so much, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.